Hello, and welcome to lecture number four in module number five on this online series in cognition. We just finished up talking about elaborative processing and memory. We're going to move now and talk uh, a little bit about how uh, encoding and retrieval interact in episodic memory. We'll start off talking about the role of retrieval, and then we'll talk about encoding retrieval interactions and talk about a very famous study uh, by Fisher and Crake. And we'll introduce the encoding specificity principle and then extend it to uh, talking about state-dependent memory. And then we'll finish up by looking at a little bit of information on how context can affect episodic memory. But let's start with the role of retrieval. Type of retrieval has a significant effect on memory performance. So if we look, this is just an example um, comparing memory performance in free recall, cued recall, and recognition. So free recall is, of course, where you just freely recall, write down whatever you can remember from a list of words. Cued recall, you're given some sort of memory cue. So uh, this word was paired with that word, or this word was spoken by this person. Um, some sort of memory cue. From an applied perspective, we might think of uh, some sort of prompt, like an essay perhaps, um, or a short answer question. You know, what is the definition of you know, blah, blah, blah. In class, we talked about this phenomenon that was introduced by so-and-so. Um, so those are memory cues to get you at that um, memory, which is different from uh, write down everything you know. So a free recall test in, an in a class would be, here's a pad of paper, write down everything you can remember from the last four weeks. You can imagine that would be very difficult. Um, recognition memory then is, uh, in ex an experimental context, is when you're given a list of words to study. So you study, say, 50 words are presented on the screen one at a time, and then you're presented with 100 words, uh, and you have to determine which of those words was presented earlier. So which ones do you recognize from the earlier study list? So that would be a type of what we call recognition memory. You can see that memory performance is the highest. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that uh, we won't get into at this point, but they are different types of retrieval. So the first thing we uh, have to get out is that retrieval matters. Um, so uh, we use different retrieval strategies all the time. So in a multiple choice exa exam versus an essay exam, you do use different retrieval processes. In a multiple choice exam, you, of course, are trying to determine the difference between concepts because you have to pick the correct answer amongst some distractors. So you have to figure out which is the right answer. And so you have pretty good cue, which is that stem of the question. Uh, then you have to figure out, you know, okay, here's an item. How do I remember it? What's the definition of that? So it's really kind of a cued recall slash recognition memory kind of task. An essay exam is a little bit different, of course. You have to retrieve much more information on your own and generate it much more on your own. Uh, you have to think about uh, all of the things that might go into an essay. And so one of the things I always tell my students is one of the things you should do in an exam is you should, if it's multiple choice and essay or multiple choice and short answer, it doesn't really matter, is you should do the short answer or essay questions first, or you should at least look at them and maybe sketch out part of an answer and just you know make some notes. Um, and then go through and do the multiple choice questions. And the reason for that is somewhere in that multiple choice section is bound to be something that will cue you to something you might have forgotten in that essay or something you want to include in that essay. And that's why I say sketch out, maybe outline an answer quick. Uh, and that will be really helpful because you're using different types of memory processes and those cues in that exam will help you along that way. Well, we've been talking about elaboration and levels of processing, and we haven't really talked much about retrieval conditions uh, and how retrieval might be part of this entire story. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is how does retrieval play a role in this entire phenomenon we've been talking about. Uh, before we even move on to that, though, we do want to add in here uh, that retrieval is another type of learning. So retrieval is, in fact, its own type of encoding, as we're starting to realize. And when we talk about the neurobiology or neuropsychology of memory in the next lecture, you'll see that when we retrieve uh, a memory, it actually gets re-encoded. Uh, and we'll actually watch a movie called Memory Hackers as part of this whole process. Um, and it's a great movie. I highly recommend uh, anyone watching on YouTube, for example. You can find it. It's um, from PBS. I think it's Nova. Um, did the special. It's really great. Um, really great special. 
So that gets us into talking about encoding and retrieval interactions. And this is a very famous study conducted by Frisch, Fisher, and Craig uh, in the late 1970s. And in this particular study, they manipulated type of encoding, just like we saw in previous studies, similar to levels of processing studies. Does it rhyme with? Does it fit into a category? Does it fit into this sentence? So we start off with three different levels of processing, or three different types of encoding. What's different here is they also manipulated type of retrieval. So they got a retrieval cue in this kind of study. Does it rhyme with? Does it belong to the category? Does it fit into this sentence? So this results in what we call a 3x3 three three encoding by retrieval design. And so this is actually what we call a factorial design in experimental psychology. And it's called a factorial design because we're going to match each type of encoding with each type of retrieval. So some items will be encoded with a rhyme and retrieved with a rhyme. Encoded with a rhyme, retrieved based on a category. Re encoded with a rhyme, retrieved based on whether it fits into a sentence. And et cetera, et cetera. So there's really nine different cells in this experiment, um, or th nine different conditions uh, altogether. So it's a complex design, but one that's really elegant and quite simple to understand. And what they found is that encoding matters, but so does retrieval. So if we look at this graph, um, when participants encoded based on a rhyme and retrieved based on a rhyme, which is uh, the blue bars, are uh, retrieved based on rhyme, the red are retrieved based on category, and the yellow retrieved based on sentence. And you can see here, performance here when encoding with a rhyme is best when retrieving with a rhyme. When encoding with a category, when retrieving with a category. And when encoding with a sentence, when retrieving with a sentence. So this demonstrates that encoding does matter. So you can see, overall, performance is best in these category and sentence conditions, but only when we're retrieving in categories or sentences. And then you can see down here, rhyme performance uh, is best when encoding with a rhyme and retrieving with a rhyme. It's terrible when encoding with a rhyme and retrieving any other way. What this demonstrates is that it's the match between encoding and retrieval. And this is actually what we call an interaction effect between encoding and retrieval. And in fact, the, an interaction is where we have the effect of one independent variable depending on the level of another independent variable. So the two independent variables interact with one another. And we have two independent variables here. We have type of encoding and type of retrieval. And so this is an interaction effect. So what we see is it's that match between encoding and retrieval. So when encoding matches retrieval, that's when we get the best performance. And so our data is best explained by that interaction effect between encoding and retrieval. So that is the first beginnings of looking at how type of encoding and type of retrieval might have an important role to play in how our memory works. I want to then extend this to some other studies. It's another great study by a guy named Badele where they went into a scuba diving class and they had participants study on land or while well, underwater. So they studied list, uh, word lists on land or underwater, and then they retrieved them, or tested, or tested on land or underwater. And what you can see is essentially um, what we found in the previous study. When conditions at encoding match conditions at retrieval, then we get the best memory performance. So when studying on land, we do best when we retrieve on land. When studying underwater, best when we retrieve underwater. So this is where we get at this idea that context is also another important part of encoding and retrieval, in particular this kind of really salient context. You know, the paint color on your wall, studying in your room versus studying in a classroom, they're pretty minimal effects. Uh, so I wouldn't go and study in the classroom where you're going to be tested because uh, the effects is not going to be that high. I, what I would actually recommend, and we'll talk about this later, is encoding in a bunch of different contexts because you want it to be independent of context. So it's studies like this that lead uh, to some really interesting applications of memory. So NASA is oftentimes tasked, of course, with trying to train astronauts to work in zero gravity or low gravity environments. So to do that, they will build these giant neutral buoyancy tanks where uh, pools really, and they'll build a mock-up of the space shuttle, the, the uh, space station, and get people to work 
in that kind of low gravity environment because people are floating in water. It's somewhat similar to floating in space. It's not identical, but it's much closer to uh, what you would find on land. And then, of course, they get used to doing um, weightless flight uh, by uh, doing the parabolic flight, what they call it the vomit comet, where they go up and then dive down and you become weightless when you, um, in that sort of parabolic flight, uh, they do. Uh, but all of this gets us this idea of context and memory. So all of this leads to then the development of what's called the, the encoding specificity principle, where the effectiveness of a retrieval queue depends on whether that queue provides the same type of information processed at encoding. The simplest way to put that is the match between encoding and retrieval conditions is a critical component of memory. This is also known as transfer appropriate processing. Again, as per usual, we like to name things twice. Couldn't have one single name for anything in cognitive psychology. Um, this is a well-known uh, phenomenon in memory, and in fact, it's found in study after study after study. Uh, one of the things that we think is going on is this is they partially explain the levels of processing effect, because particularly in meaning-based processing, we believe that retrieval in episodic memory is meaning-based and not sort of physically based, that is, perceptually based, things like sound or the way something looks, but based on meaning-based processing. So we think um, levels of processing occurs because it's matching retrieval with type of encoding. So those, this match between encoding and retrieval is a particularly important part of how memory functions. This gets us to another uh, number of other interesting results, uh, some of which, of course, are legendary on most college campuses. And one of them is, of course, study drunk, test drunk. And this is what we call state-dependent memory. Now, first of all, I want it very clear. Best performance is sober, sober. Let's make that very clear. Um, in fact, this study probably overestimates the drunk, drunk performance, um, this graph here, but gives you an idea of what we're talking about. But state-dependent memory is memory retrieval is most efficient when the individual is in the same state of consciousness as they were when the memory was formed. And so here we're talking about if you are studying sober, test sober, if unfortunately for some whatever reason you study drunk, you should probably um, test drunk. You can see the worst performance is sober at recall, um, drunk at learning. And so let's try not Try not to do that. Best performance is sober, sober. Nicotine is another drug that shows a strong state-dependent effect, in particular when you compare that to marijuana. Um, so if you look at people who smoke tobacco at encoding, um, performance is very high. It's very low uh, when they smoke tobacco at encoding and uh, marijuana at retrieval. Uh, but encoding tobacco, retrieval tobacco uh, is the a highest uh, memory performance. So uh, this really does demonstrate drugs like nicotine have strong state-dependent effects. Caffeine is another one. It also shows a strong state-dependent effect. So here we have caffeine, 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 placebo, placebo, caffeine, and placebo, placebo. And performance is highest wherein uh, we match caffeine at encoding and retrieval or no caffeine at encoding and retrieval. So if you like coffee when you study, bring some coffee to that exam. Uh, finally, we get then into mood-dependent memory uh, and what is often called the mood congruency effect. And performance is best when we match moods between study and test because this is related to sort of a conscious states. So if we're sad at encoding, we perform best when we're sad at retrieval. Same thing with if we're in a neutral mood or when we're in a happy mood. Performance is always best when we match these two together. This is also related to what we call the mood congruency effect. And basically, you will remember things that are congruent with your current mood. So when you're happy, you remember happy things. When you're sad, you remember sad things. And this can be particularly problematic uh, from a clinical perspective because people will ruminate. That is when they, something unfortunate has happened and they're feeling down because of it. They remember lots of other times they were down and what happened when they were down. And so then they just spiral. And so you have to really watch out for that um, because this can be particularly problematic. It's one of the reasons why um, in mood regulation, one of the best things is distraction, because if you can get people a bit out of that sad mood, they won't ruminate, they won't keep retrieving bad memories, and um, they'll do better. And it's one of the reasons why humor is very good. So watch a funny movie, or go out and run, 
Exercise is another great um, strategy for that as well. <clears throat> so all of this gets back at this idea of state-dependent memory and the encoding specificity principle. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about context in learning. Uh, so there's some recent evidence that indicates that context is really a critical component of episodic memory. Um, and uh, Rich Marsh and some of his colleagues, including my good friend Gabriel Cook, um, looked at items that were experienced in many versus few contexts. And, it, and essentially what they're looking at are things that you, words that you might have known uh, quite a bit, so you've experienced it in a lot of contexts, or new words. So that you've experienced in few contexts. So this is what you're doing in college, is you're learning a bunch of new stuff, a bunch of new words that you've never heard of, a um, bunch of new terms like the encoding specificity principle and that kind of thing. Um, and what they found is that items experienced um, suffered a switch in context from study to test. That should say items experienced in few contexts suffer from a switch in context from study to test. I don't know how I left out all of that information on that particular slide. Uh, but the uh, essential finding is things that are new to you are really tied to their context. So one of the things I encourage my students to do and I encourage everyone to do is if you're trying to study something new is mix up your context. Study at home, study at Starbucks, study at the library, study outside. Um, study in the cafeteria so that you don't have this kind of link to context that we're talking about because you want to break it free of that context and so mix it up a bit. One of the lores of um, how to study is people always say you should have one place that you study, you should always study there. No, 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 terrible idea, terrible idea. You want to mix up contexts and study in as many contexts as possible. Uh, so take your books with you. Study on the metro, study on the bus, study at the bar for a few minutes. Now you don't want to study while you're drunk, but you know if you're just going to sit down and have a sandwich, um, study for a little bit and put the books away and then do whatever you're going to do. Um, many contexts is particularly important because it breaks that link. And some other research um, that we have conducted, uh, in particular a study that I conducted uh, with Elliot Hirschman and another study that Lynn Reeder found, uh, is that midazolam amnesia is related to context. We'll talk more about midazolam amnesia when we get to drugs and cognition. But essentially what we do in these studies is we take normal healthy people, and we give them this drug called midazolam, it's also called Versed. Um, and under the influence of, of midazolam, people experience very dense amnesia. That is, whatever they've learned, or whatever's happened while they're under the influence, they just don't remember. remember. And so it's a really degraded form of memory. And what we found in our study is that um, when we ask people um, to specifically think about the time at which they were studying items under this degraded amnesia condition, they did much better. So when they were reinstating that context, they actually did much better. This gets back to something I've said in previous lectures. When you're trying to remember something uh, and it's not coming to mind, if you can get to that context, think about the time you were learning it, where you were, what you were doing, get back into that mode, uh, you might actually uh, be able to bring that information forward and try to remember it better because you've linked it to that context. Um, so we think, of course, some of this, some of this neuroscience stuff is always uh, tenuous, but the hippocampus appears to be responsible for these context-dependent memories because the hippocampus is really tied to that kind of context. And we saw that in earlier lectures with uh, place amnesia, uh, sorry, place, place agnosia, sorry. Um, we also think that some of this is related to source memory, remembering where an information, where a, um, a memory comes from. And in particular, I think our midazolam study looked at if you could tie the source to the memory, you could do better. So getting at the source gets you at the memory itself as well. And we'll talk more about source memory uh, when we start talking about things like um, eyewitness testimony, that sort of thing. Uh, well, in our next lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the neuropsychology of memory. Uh, and uh, then in the next module, we're going to start looking at how memory works in everyday context, things like eyewitness testimony, study habits, that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully we've set up a good base uh, to go from for that, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you further.